we'd all kind of given up seeing the Postal Service for a long time. <laughs> when you first hear it really connects with you and you kind of build like an experience around that and you kind of carry those memories with you. Whenever you hear that, you think back on those memories. It brought me back to my angsty high school years. It felt good and bad at the same time. Listen, this is a band that has put out one album. And one album. Everyone showed up for that. And they packed a house in New York. A at big the house. Center. That's um, freaking ridiculous. That, that tells you a lot. Smear blacking. Your palms are sweaty. I'm barely listening to last email. For me, this tour has been as much about kind of reclaiming these songs in a way. It's been really humbling to see how much this record means to people because I haven't interfaced with that in 10 years. The vast majority of people who got into this album got into it after we were kind of done doing it. We did some touring in the spring of 2003 and then we were done. And then all of a sudden we're like, the record sold 100,000 copies, the record sold 200,000 copies, the record went gold. And that all happened after we kind of stopped promoting it. So all the sounds for most of the songs came off of this uh, it's a sampler and a synthesizer, so like this is the stuff for District Sleeps Alone tonight. Like this is the main organ sound from it. And it was just like an edited version of a sound called Neo Prophet. This was the original. So I edited that sound and made it into that organ. I was pretty surprised that this sampler even worked because I hadn't used it in almost 10 years. This was the laptop that I used to make the record, and also for the first tour. It doesn't turn on anymore, so that made it a little harder to, to remake the songs for this tour because all the pieces were kind of scattered on external hard drives. When those chords came into District, I truly like had to turn around because I was like crying. <laughs> I was like so emotional, truly emotional, because like these dudes made this like amazing thing, and this is lame. <laughs> I'm like emotional about it, and the fact that like people are still stoked about it, it's like amazing. I never thought I'd get to play places like this. Truly, it's crazy. I feel I must interject to you. Omaha, Nebraska, uh, recording a Rilo Kylie record, and my phone rang early in the morning, perfect Gibbard fashion. Hey, this is Ben Gibbard of Death Cab for Cutie. I was like, what the f 
He's like, hey, I just got your number, and I, you know, I want to know if you want to sing on this record that I'm doing with my friend. The first time we met was when she came and picked me up at Burbank Airport. So she picked me up, and we went and got lunch, and then we're like, we're going over to Jimmy's house, and we're recording vocals for the next three days. Over the course of the week that I was down there working on the record with Jimmy, you know, every day, like, Jenny and Jimmy and I were hanging out at Jimmy's house and going out to lunch and, you know, kind of forging a friendship while we were making this record. I actually had all of my original notes from 10 years ago. I had, I found Where, the letter that you wrote me. It's like a written, handwritten letter? A handwritten letter, yeah. For me. Really? Because you called me. That's my sister. <laughs> talking about changing technology. <coughs> Dear Jenny. <laughs> Dear Jenny. This is Ben Gibbard. <laughs> Here are the songs that we want you to sing on. Hope to hear from you soon. <laughs> Well, it was like 2002, and, and Death Cab was kind of on a break from touring. So I was writing the songs for Transatlanticism and for Give Up kind of at the same time. And then I would get the CDs from Jimmy in the mail. It would have like one or two songs on them. They would just say like P.S. and then, you know, like, and then some nickname for whatever the, like the, the instrumental he had written was called. <laughs> We usually didn't send stuff back and forth very many times. I'd send him kind of the basic idea, and then he'd usually cut little bits out or move parts around or repeat parts that he wanted to sing on, and then send me back a guide track with his vocals. I've got a cover with cans of food, filtered water and pictures of you, and I'm not coming out until this is all. The way I wrote a lot of those songs was just I'd get the music from Jimmy and I'd at the time put it into Disc Man and like walk around my neighborhood in Capitol Hill in Seattle and just kind of, you know, hum to myself and kind of, you know, have a little notebook, like jot down little ideas and then come back and then write the lyrics based on whatever I kind of came up with on those, you know, kind of walking kind of trips. I wanted to walk. I think the thing I remember about what was going on in the world in 2002 is that obviously there were post 9-11 there was an Iraq war beginning and there were you know things on a, on a global scale that were kind of terrifying but it was a time in my life where there was nothing going on that wasn't happening in my neighborhood nothing happening in the world worth paying attention to other than indie rock and making records and going to shows and drinking beer and in the long run that's not necessarily a good thing but at the time you know, you just, I didn't care about anything other than making music. Are we going to play Such Great Heights uh, uh, nine times tonight? Yes, we are. <laughs> like Watch the Throne? Play it once in the set and then we'll just... I think we should just play it until people, there's nobody left. What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? Thank you so much for coming to this uh, tiny little venue to see us play some uh, music from 10 years ago. <laughs> We're called the Postal Service. We have no fixed address. Ben is, I think, the musical director. He made us all these notes, and it would say, like, Jenny, Guitar, high part, and keyboard, low part. Laura, vibraphone. Jimmy, magic. <laughs> this is like this weird thing that I can grab parts of the track into here 
and then um, play them back at different speeds. So I can I start just like a loop of the, the beeps and this could go on forever so we can like talk over it or and, and we've been doing something where we like Thank you very much. Uh, folks, I was joking earlier, the real reason that we are here 10 years later is because this record still means something to you and that is so amazingly humbling. It, you can't even begin to understand how much it means to us. And this is our big love song and it goes out to you. Virtually every interview I've done between 2003 and now has ended with the interviewer saying like, okay, I've got one more question for you, and I always will just cut them off and be like, no, I don't know when there's going to be another Pearl Service record. And they're like, oh, how'd you know? It's like, because I've been asked this question a thousand times in the last five years. You know, I've only recognized now, only in the last six months, that the reason people keep asking is we're not talking. We're not telling you that there's going to be or not be another record. We're not playing live shows so you can't come and interface with this, you know, band that you're fond of. It's been kind of fun to be transported back to the daydreams that kind of inspired those songs. In just kind of talking about doing this tour and doing these shows and Know why the Postal Service has taken this odd kind of journey that they've been on for the last 10 years. You know, I'm finally able to kind of feel proud of this. I've always felt proud of the record, but I've, I'm able to kind of get a, a real gauge on what we have inadvertently accomplished, you know, all these years later. You know, here I am shooting baskets in yeah. Barclays Center. Yeah. So.